Football is littered with awful owners, and it has been for years. In English football, we've seen particularly bad owners, whether it's the likes of Mike Ashley or the Glazers at the top of the pyramid, or there was the truly batch crazy ones lower down the leagues, like Francesco Bacchetti at Leighton Orient, or even Todd Bowley in his special 4 4 3 formation at Chelsea. But there's one man who stands out as particularly ridiculous, with some of the most mental ideas you'll have ever heard of in football. He goes by the name of John Gurney, and his time in charge of Luton lasted just 55 days, in which not a single minute of football would be played, yet still contained a ridiculous amount of drama. Now before we get started on his actual spell in charge, let's take a look at what happened before Gurney bought the club, which funnily enough is a good segue into the fact that this video is actually a follow-up to another video on the channel, about the entire history of Luton. So I'll cover the few years before Gurney took over now, but if you want a deeper look at Luton, check out that video afterwards. It'll be linked in the description and at the end of this video. Before the creation of the Premier League, Luton had become an icon of first division English football, with their plastic pitch helping them to stay up year after year. However, after a decade at the top, Luton would be relegated in 1992, the final season before the Premier League, meaning that after voting in favour of the Premier League, Luton would not play in it, making them a founding member of a division that they would never play in. With this relegation came financial problems, and Luton became a bit of a yo-yo club in English football, and by 2001, they found themselves in the 4th division. Manager Joe Kinnear managed to get Luton promoted from the 4th tier at the first time of asking though, and became a very popular man in Luton, with his heroics helping to stop the rot at the club. Then after a great first season in the 3rd tier, where Luton finished 9th, in came John Gurney on the 23rd of May 2003. And what was the first thing that Gurney would do? Sack Joe Kinnear. After being sacked, Kinnear wouldn't be paid his owed money for weeks, stating that Gurney had champagne ideas and Coca-Cola pockets, which is the start of a running theme throughout this story. Luton fans were unhappy with the decision, and retaliated by protesting outside the stadium, as well as boycotting buying season tickets, with the number of season ticket holders going from an average of over 4,000 by that point in the summer, to around 1,000. After seeing the backlash, Gurney realised he had to get the fans back on his side with a new managerial appointment. So in one of the weirdest aspects of this story, he decided to create Manager Idol, based off of TV show Pop Idol, which allowed the Luton fans to vote for who they wanted to manage the club. Former manager Joe Kinnear won the general supporters vote by a landslide. However, ex-Hartlepool coach Mark Newell won the vote by the supporters shareholders by just four votes over Kinnear, meaning the decision went down to a board meeting. The board chose to go with Mark Newell, although it's debated that the contracts had been signed before voting had even ended, meaning it was likely the board would hire Newell regardless. And so despite Kinnear reportedly receiving over 82% of combined votes, he had either refused to rejoin the club or Gurney had deliberately fixed the poll allowing the decision to go to the board, where they could choose Newell. With the decision of the manager out of the way, Gurney focused on the long-term future of the club. Luton had bought a large plot of land just off the M1, where Gurney had the ambition of building a 70,000-seat stadium, which would be used for NFL and NBA franchises as well as the usual Luton Town games. It's important to note that their stadium held just a little over 10,000 fans, meaning Gurney wanted to effectively fill seven Kenilworth roads while the club was still in the third tier. Not only this, but Gurney planned to change the name of Luton Town FC to London Luton FC to match the name of the airport which he believed would link the club more to the surrounding area. Gurney was particularly obsessed with rebranding Luton. He'd previously described the Hatters as a grotty little club and continuously attempted to either rename the club or move it elsewhere. Another one of these plans was to merge the club with Wimbledon, who were over 40 miles away, in order to secure a place in the division above, where he believed they would make more money. And most bizarrely of all, he planned to build an F1 track around the stadium. Yes, you heard that right, an F1 track. If things had gone his way, the likes of Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen would be racing around the streets of Luton. He claimed the track would net the club £50 million in profit each year, and would help them to kick on and reach the Premier League. Obviously, none of this would happen, so back onto the day-to-day -day situation of the club. On Thursday the 26th of June 2003, payday for club employees, nobody had been paid, including the players. After taking over contracts from the previous owners, the consortium led by John Gurney decided not to send the money on the 26th of June, as they believed it made more sense to pay people on the final day of the month. It's important to also mention that this occurred five weeks into the new ownership of the club, and they'd already paid the previous month's wages a week late as well, meaning they'd missed payment two months in a row. As well as this, Andrew Zimler, who had been financial director since John Gurney took over, still had not seen any financial documents over a month into Gurney's ownership. Luckily, the club promised they'd pay the wages the next day. They didn't. The weekend then passed without the wages being paid, so John Gurney decided to visit the club, when he then found out on his way to the club offices that Luton owed millions of pounds to a private company, which they'd somehow been unaware of until this point, six weeks into his ownership of the club. It's also important to mention that this Monday was the 30th of June, the same day Gurney had said he wanted to pay the staff in the first place, and yet still didn't manage to pay the wages. So how did Gurney deal with this payment situation? 
by blaming middle management who also hadn't been paid and who had attempted to get in contact with Gurney for days without answer. He sounds like a really nice guy. As he still hadn't given anyone at the club a solid answer about payment, even middle management who he blamed the situation on, financial director Andrew Zimbler did some research and found out that Gurney had previously owned Bedford Rugby Club. Upon finding this out, Zimbler decided to schedule a meeting with the new owners of Bedford, a fan-owned group who'd purchased the club off Gurney. It turns out that in the short time Gurney spent at Bedford, there was also significant problems in paying wages on time, which had to be rectified by the new owners. Bedford also claimed that Gurney had previously lied about an offshore group of investors, despite never actually mentioning any of them by name the same situation that was occurring at Luton. Finally, on Tuesday the 1st of July, the club had managed to pay the missing wages. Emphasis on the club, as all the money had come from club funds and not investment from the consortium, the same way employees were paid the month before. Furthermore, club funds were significantly lower than normal due to the fact Gurney's interference with ex-manager Joe Kinnear had meant that, like I mentioned earlier, season ticket sales were less than a quarter of the usual numbers. Gurney then decided that to increase club funds, he should combine the ticket office and the club shop and then outsourced the workload, allowing a new company to come in and run said departments for them. He did all of this without letting anybody below board level at the club know, meaning middle management and those who worked in the affected departments would likely have had no idea what was going on until the companies came in to look at the club shops. It was at this point, and following the investigations of Andrew Zimbler, members of the Supporters Trust decided they should also do some investigating, specifically into the financial situation of the club. After finding out about the millions owed by the club, the Supporters Trust believed they could use it to their advantage and force Gurney out. The Trust then got in contact with Gurney and arranged various meetings in which they could talk about ownership of Luton. With all of the financial drama going on at the club, the FA placed Luton under a transfer embargo, further strengthening the position of the Supporters Trust. Through fundraising from other fans, the Trust were able to purchase significant shares in an offshore company named Hatters Holdings, which was the same company that were owed millions by the club. Through all of these factors, the Supporters Trust were able to force Gurney into placing the club into administrative receivership, a similar process to administration, and put the club into the hands of the trust. So on the 14th of July 2003, one day before their first pre-season friendly, John Gurney had successfully been forced out of Luton after just 55 days in charge. Throughout the ordeal, Gurney had shown himself to be aggressive and very difficult to work with, stating that if they expect me to walk away from Luton with nothing, I'll make sure there's nothing to walk away from. He then walked away from the club with nothing. Sadly for Luton, this wasn't the end of their troubles. And as I mentioned earlier, I went over what happened after this moment in an early video which will be linked at the end of this one. But it was the end of one of the most bizarre 55 days in the history of any football club worldwide. There's been plenty of bad owners in football, but John Gurney was special. It takes a certain level of madness to happily title yourself the most hated man in football. And in just 55 days, John Gurney did that and so much more. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you very much for watching. If you made it this far into the video, fit either the word Hamilton or Verstappen into a comment. The older video I mentioned throughout this one should be on screen now, so feel free to watch that while you're here. And most importantly, enjoy your day.